Most of us have seen the original film, The Exorcist, which released in 1973. And if you have never viewed the movie, you have most likely heard of it, as it was based on a true story. Only in the real story, it was a young boy who was supposedly possessed when his aunt introduced him to the Ouija board that was thought to be the cause of his possession. The Ouija is also the catalyst in the movie for what is to come for the young girl in the movie that is blamed for her possession as well. The movie was one of the most profitable horror movies ever made for its time. It literally horrified people, even to the point that some would walk out before the movie was over. The plot involves a young Reagan, played by Linda Blair, who starts acting odd, levitating, speaking in tongues, not to mention the famous scene of her head spinning 360. A worried mother, played by Ellen Burstyn, seeks medical help only to hit a dead end when a local priest steps in, played by Jason Miller, who believes the girl to be possessed by the devil. The priest makes a request to the church to perform an exorcism, and they send in an expert Jesuit priest, played by Max von Sydow, to help. And the rest is history. Did you know that it is possible that a real-life serial killer was actually given a small role in the movie? Now, it is and has never been proven that the man I am going to tell you about was actually a serial killer. But in 1979, Paul Bateson was convicted of murder, and prior to Bateson's trial, police and prosecutors implicated him in a string of unsolved killings of gay men in Manhattan and reported that he even bragged about the killings to other inmates during his incarceration at Rikers Island, located in the Bronx in New York City. Although he was never tried for the murders, if he did commit what was called the bag murders, where gay men were being killed, dismembered, and placed in bags and then dumped in the Hudson River, if Bateson were responsible, he would definitely have been a serial killer. And if not him, then whomever committed these acts was never caught. Nonetheless, Bateson was still a killer. Bateson was convicted of murdering film industry journalist Addison Beryl in 1979 and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. So back it up a few years to 1973, when William Friedkin, the film's director for The Exorcist, watched Bateson, who was a real radiographer, also known as an X-ray technician, perform a cerebral angiogram the previous year for research to incorporate into a scene in his film. Friedkin was so impressed with the procedure that he gave Bateson a part in the film to play a radiographer to recreate the procedure on Linda Blair's character. The scene, of course, was fake, as it was a movie, but they wanted to make it look as real as possible to the real procedure Bateson had performed for Friedkin's research. The scene involved a considerable amount of blood on screen and was praised by many viewers and considered the most disturbing scene in which medical professionals even praised it for its realism. Around the time of the movie's release, Bateson had developed a serious alcohol problem which eventually led to him losing his job in 1975. By 1977, Paul Bateson was drinking so heavily that he was drinking at least a quart of vodka a day, which greatly began to affect his life, making him passive and awkward, which affected his social life. He was quoted as saying, after a few shots, I'd shave and get dressed, intending to go out, but after the vodka, I had no energy left to move. On the nights he did manage to go out, he patronized what was known as leather bars, something he had begun doing in 1970 with a group that styled themselves as bikers. Bateson said that the leather impressed him, as opposed to the drag queen style of some of the gay communities. He felt that this performance style of dressing up as women as stereotyping gay men, that not all gay men played the roles of being feminine and speaking in falsetto tones. He claimed it gave gay men a bad name, so he was attracted to the leather bars where he felt the gay men were more masculine and what he preferred. Addison Beryl was a reporter who covered the film industry for Variety, which was an American media company founded in New York City in 1905 as a weekly newspaper that reported on theater. And in 1933, it added daily Variety based in Los Angeles to cover the motion picture industry. On September 14, 1977, he was found dead in his Horatio Street apartment. He had been beaten and stabbed, and there were some signs of a struggle. However, 
Nothing of value had been taken that they could see. Police believed that if the killer's motive had been robbery, he might have been looking for cash or jewelry since those things could be taken quickly. There was no evidence of forced entry. Beryl had likely let his killer into the apartment where there were several empty beer cans and half full liquor glasses at the scene. A friend of Beryl's, journalist Arthur Bell, who wrote for The Voice, who was also a gay activist, wrote an article of how the murders of gay men, which were occurring frequently during those times, were rarely taken seriously by the police and that they were rarely reported on in the media, citing they were seen as the results of sexual encounters gone wrong. Bell also claimed Beryl was attracted to leather bars, just like Bateson, and one in particular called the Mine Shaft, a place Bateson could often be found. The police had learned that Beryl had been at the Mine Shaft until 6 a.m. on that night and was seen talking to many other patrons. According to Bell, Beryl frequented the Mine Shaft and another bar called the Anvil, in which his presence made these bars popular because of his celebrity. Bell ended his article by giving the phone number of the New York Police Department's Homicide Bureau and asking anyone with information to call them. Eight days after the killing, someone did call, claiming to be the killer, apparently to correct Bell's assumption after disclosing in the article that the killer was a psychopath who targeted gays. The caller said, I like your story and I like your writing, but I'm not a psychopath. In a story that ran on The Voice's front page, the caller recounted the events of the night that ended at Beryl's murder, saying, I'm gay, I needed money, and I'm an alcoholic. After three months of sobriety, he claimed he had gone out to Badlands, one of the leather bars in the early hours of September 14th, where Beryl, whom he did not know, offered to buy him a beer, a proposition the caller accepted. That beer became several, with the two consuming poppers, which is a slang term for chemical inhalants one uses to get high, and in addition to using cocaine. At 3 a.m., they left Badlands and went to the mine shaft, where they continued their alcohol and drug consumption. The caller told Bell he was impressed by how popular his companion was by saying, I didn't realize he was such a superstar, and I wanted to go home with him. After two hours, they took a taxi to Beryl's apartment something the caller said Beryl was reluctant to do because he had to get up early and work on a story. After realizing that Beryl was not that interested in him, he felt rejected. He decided to do something he claimed he had never done before. So he hit Beryl with a frying pan and then stabbed him in the chest, killing him. After the killing, the caller said he took cash, totaling $57 and Beryl's master charge card, passport, and some clothes. He used the money to buy liquor and stayed drunk for the entire next day. The caller offered some information about himself and claimed to be the son of an orchestra leader to have a wife in Berlin who did not understand his homosexuality and a teenage son. He had an interest in the arts and had wanted to become a dancer when he was younger. Bell noted that he talked about wanting to atone for the crime several times which he connected the conversation taking place on Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. But he didn't want to give himself up and claimed he would lose his license and never be able to practice again and declined to tell Bell what sort of practice that license was for that would help to identify him. When Bell contacted police about the call, they told him that it seemed like the first solid lead in the case. The caller had known about the stolen credit card a detail police had not made public, and described a white substance found on the floor of Beryl's apartment as Crisco, a shortening frequently used at the time by gay men as a sexual lubricant. Police had not yet released this information as public, so the caller, knowing these details, had to be the killer. Detectives thought the caller would call Bell again and went to his apartment to wait with him. At 11 p.m., his phone rang but it was not the original caller. Instead, it was a man who identified himself as Mitch. He told Bell the killer was Paul Bateson, whom he had gotten to know while the two were drying out at St. Vincent's Hospital a few months earlier. While he believed Bateson was not the man's real name, since he knew the man to have used a pseudonym, 
Johnny Johnson at one point. He said Bateson was an unemployed x-ray technician and that he had called him earlier and confessed to the crime. Mitch asked to meet Bell in person, but the police told Bell not to do so. Instead, they just arrested Bateson at his East 12th Street apartment, where he was lying around drunk. When he was asked if he knew why he was being arrested, he pointed to an open copy of The Voice with Bell's article and indicated that was probably why. A detective went to the bar and brought Mitch in for questioning as well, and then he was released after a few hours. Bateson eventually gave police a handwritten confession that was consistent with what he had told Bell. Bateson was charged with second degree murder and detained while awaiting trial. Bell interviewed Bateson in person a month later, visiting him at Rikers Island. Bell himself later admitted that he too might have taken Bateson up on an offer to go to his apartment if he had met him in a bar rather than jail. Bateson claimed that Jill was helping him to obtain sobriety again, and that his biggest regret about being in custody was missing the new season of the Joffrey Ballet, based in New York. While Bateson avoided talking about the crime he was charged with, on what Bell thought to be advice from his attorney, he did talk about the trial. He had pleaded not guilty and expected that to be the verdict after a long trial. At the time of Bateson's arrest, police had also been investigating a series of murders of gay men over the previous two years, which they believed were committed by the same person due to similarities in the killings. The bodies of six men had been found. They were dismembered, put into bags, and floating in the Hudson River. None of them were ever identified, but police traced the clothing on them to shops in Greenwich Village that catered to the gay community. Since the bags reportedly had wording on them, connecting them to NYUMC's, the New York University Medical Center, Neuropsychiatric Unit, and the dismemberment of the bodies appeared to have been done by someone skilled in using a knife, investigators began to suggest publicly that Bateson might be a suspect, as they were officially referred to as the Cuppy Killings, an acronym for Circumstances Unknown Pending Police Investigation. Those killings were the subject of another interview Bateson gave, although it would not be made public until 2012. Friedkin, who recalled him from both his initial visit to NYUMC and the filming of the angiogram for The Exorcist as a nice young man who stood out due to the earring and studded bracelet he wore, neither of which were common accessories for men at the time, and was surprised that the gentle Bateson he recalled could have ever been accused of a murder. Friedkin came to Rikers to talk with him after getting permission from Bateson's lawyer. In an interview with Movies, The Notebook, which is an international streaming platform that coincided with the release of his film, Killer Joe, Friedkin said Bateson admitted killing Beryl, although the director then incorrectly stated that Bateson had dismembered the body and thrown the bagged body parts in the river because in reality, Beryl was found dead in his apartment, not dismembered in the Hudson. Bateson said that the prosecutors were offering him a deal whereby if he confessed to the bag murders and some of the other unsolved killings, he would receive a shorter sentence. But he told Friedkin he was not sure if he would accept it. In pretrial motions, Bateson attempted to have his confession suppressed. He argued that he had been drunk at the time and the police had not yet read him his rights. Bateson also denied having made the phone call to Bell, claiming his purported confession was just based on what he had read about the case in the article written by Bell. Bateson went on trial in early 1979. The state entered both his confession and Bell's voice article into evidence against him. Contrary to his prediction of a long trial in the wake of his arrest, Bateson was convicted after four days on March 5, 1979. At Bateson's sentencing a month later, prosecutor William Hoyt called him a psychopath and reiterated his belief that he was responsible for the six unsolved murders. While Hoyt admitted there was no direct proof of this, he said that Bateson had confessed to those crimes in a conversation with Richard Ryan, 
a friend who had testified for the state at the trial that Bateson had confessed the Barrow murder to him. Speaking for himself, Bateson denied any role in the other murders. Justice Morris Goldman sentenced Bateson to 20 years to life in prison, five years less than the minimum Hoyt had asked for. He didn't believe that there was really enough connection to the bag murders to merit any consideration in prosecuting Bateson. In a 2018 Esquire article about Bateson, writer Matt Miller was unable to find what that evidence might have been as the New York County Clerk's Office could not find a copy of the trial transcript and nothing Miller had been able to review mentioned either the bags purportedly being traced to NYUMC or any mention of a deal offered to Bateson if he confessed to the other murders. Bateson served 24 years and three months of his sentence, becoming eligible for parole in 1997. On the day after his 63rd birthday in August of 2003, he was released from Arthur Kill Correctional Facility on Staten Island. According to online records kept by the state's Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, his parole was successfully completed in November of 2008. That was the last known public record of Bateson available as of 2021. Where he is living or if he is even alive is not known for sure. Miller attempted to contact Bateson for his Esquire article in 2018 at his last known address in the Long Island village of Freeport, but was unsuccessful as the phone had been disconnected. In his podcast interview around the same time, Friedkin said he had heard Bateson was living somewhere in upstate New York. A record in the Social Security Death Index shows that a Paul F. Bateson with the same birth date and a Social Security number issued in Pennsylvania died on September 15, 2012. Paul Bateson was portrayed by actor Morgan Kelly in the second season of the Netflix series Mindhunter which is a really good show and I'm hoping they will eventually come out with a season three, but as of now, they claim because of high production costs, that may never happen. But here's the hoping. Here's the clip of the making of that scene from The Exorcist. If you actually watch the movie, Bateson, who was not an actor, but an x-ray technician in real life, was given a small part in the movie and is well in frame and even has several speaking lines as he helps assist in performing the procedure when Reagan's mother takes her in for testing after she begins to display the odd behavior before it is realized that she is actually possessed by the devil and not a medical condition. Okay, you're gonna feel some pressure here. Now, don't move. 